about the draft SSASP. We ask you to hold your questions until after the presentation. Uh, this session is recorded, so you will be able to watch it later, I believe after May 1st. And so Craig, whenever you're ready. Okay, I am still here. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Pinky mentioned, my name is Craig. I am a planner with uh, Parkland Community Planning Services. I have the privilege of presenting the draft South Shore Area Structure Plan uh, to you. So the presentation, I'm going to give a quick overview and hopefully stick to around a 30 minute uh, type time frame. So first up, uh, what is an area structure plan? Uh, so an area structure plan is a conceptual policy plan that is adopted by Council and it addresses future land uses and roads and infrastructure in a, uh, a set area or a, a series of parcels. It identifies uses like residential and open space areas and tries to relate that to the type of infrastructure necessary to support that future development in terms of water, wastewater systems, roads, and stormwater management. Area structure plans speak to the level of uh, intensity of development and the type of development that will occur in an area. And they also lay out a process that landowners are interested in going ahead and developing their property are expected to follow to take the concepts of the area structure plan and move that towards being a concrete project on the ground. And we'll spend a, a bit more time talking about that uh, on another slide. In terms of the area that the draft plan covers, uh, that is shown here on the slide that's up on the screen right now. Uh, this air photo is from 2015. And all the lands that are within the yellow dashed line are intended to be covered by the South Shore Area Structure Plan. So that includes uh, the old McDonald's resort in the far west. Uh, this is Highway 835, roughly speaking, in the middle, all the way over to the area east between Roshan Sands and the Summer Village of White Sands. It does not include any of the land that's within the Summer Villages. The draft plan that we're looking at is intended to replace the Buffalo Lake South Shore Intermunicipal Development Plan. So on the screen uh, uh, now is the area covered by that plan, and it's outlined here in the black dashed lines. It only applies to land within the county, within the two summer villages, and the south shore of the lake. Uh, the draft area structure plan that we're working on will cover the area that's shown as orange, which is identified as a south shore growth node under the Buffalo Lake Intermunicipal Development Plan. Uh, without the lands that are also shown in orange in the summer village of White Sands, and in Roshan Sands. Uh, the area structure plan, once it's adopted, would replace the, the Buffalo Lake South Shore IDP, which means that the light green area called limited development would no longer have the plan covering it, but would still be covered under the larger Buffalo Lake Intermunicipal Development Plan. So the Buffalo Lake Intermunicipal Development Plan is the agreement between the five municipalities around the lake on how to manage land uses and changes within the area identified uh, around the lake. And that outline the area covered is shown with the blue dashed line that you can see on the graphic extending through Camrose County, through County of Stettler, and around to Lacombe County. So in the area that's limited development, uh, even though there will be one less plan in that area, they'll still be governed by the policies in the Buffalo Lake uh, IDP. <clears throat> so th there are a series of plans that will apply to the South Shore uh, Growth Note. The area structure the plan that we're preparing is one. Uh, so the Buffalo Lake IDP will also apply and the county's municipal development plan also applies to the area. Uh, the series of plans or layers is what planners refer to as a hierarchy of plans. Uh, so we tend to go from very broad and general down to more specific. When we get to right down to the land use bylaw, that's where we set out the actual rules and regulations on how to approve subdivisions and development permits on individual properties. One of the general rules when you apply the hierarchy of plans is that any policy that's in a higher level or more senior plan, which in this particular, uh, particular case would be the Buffalo Lake IDP or the County of Stettler Municipal Development Plan, those policies apply no matter what the draft ASP uh, below it says. So if there's silence, the policies of the uh, high, more senior plan kind of percolate through and still apply. Uh, area structure plan may provide more detail or more specific details than those senior plans 
but it can't contradict or be inconsistent with it. And all three of the plans are supposed to line up and uh, head in the same direction and be consistent with one another. When county plan, uh, planning staff evaluate proposals, they look at all the plans that apply to a piece of land. And you can probably guess that sometimes it's a long lengthy checklist to work your way through from the Buffalo Lake IDP through the MDP, through once approved the South Shore ASP, and then the land use bylaw. So a new plan uh, is being created to replace the Buffalo Lake or South Shore Intermunicipal Development Plan uh, because the county has found that the current plan does not adequately accommodate the types of development that the county is prepared to see in the area. The experience with the Paradise Shore site uh, in particular shows that the approach taken to development density in the current plan doesn't really adequately account for recreational forms of development or RV camps uh, or RV parks. Uh, the county has sought agreement with the other partners in the plan, the, the two summer villages, to change the current plan. Unfortunately, that has uh, not been achieved, and the county is in the process of mediating their withdrawal from the, the Buffalo Lake South Shore Intermunicipal Development Plan. Uh, recognizing that we can't leave a vacuum, the South Shore Area Structure Plan is being prepared parallel to that process so that there's guidance on what will happen or intended to happen on the county area to allow coordination with the two summer villages and also demonstrate how the county will fulfill the obligations to all the municipalities around the lake uh, under the Buffalo Lake Intermunicipal Development Plan. So in terms of the, the draft document itself, it's structured in uh, three major parts. Uh, the first is part A, which is background information. It's a snapshot in time. It's not real data, but that gives you a sense of what was happening at the time that the plan was being prepared or updated. Uh, this area does not set policy. Part B is an area that provides a little bit more narrative on the six major concepts that you can see listed on the right-hand side of the screen that sets the stage or gives a sense of why the policies were written the way they are. But in and of itself, Part B is not policy. The portion of the document that is policy is Part C, and each policy statement is clearly identified as such with a number, a brief text explanation, uh, and that would all those statements would apply as part of the evaluation of future proposals or land use changes. Maps one through seven are background and maps A through D are form part of the policies. I'm actually gonna start at the back of the plan. Uh, usually the, we talk about what we'd like to build and then we talk about how we're gonna get there, uh, but you're gonna hear the terms uh, local area structure plan or outline plan or site plan come up a few times during the presentation. And they certainly show up throughout the plan. Uh, these are the main tools uh, that a landowner who's interested in going forward and developing the land is expected to work their way through to develop a project and obtain county approval. So that means uh, providing more detail on the exact nature of the uses, size of lots, the layout on the land, how it's being serviced, how natural areas are being treated, uh, how stormwater management is being addressed, a whole series of things that we need to look at to properly evaluate and uh, approve development. Uh, for areas that involve subdivision, so creating a new country residential area of two or, or more lots, the local area structure plan or the outline plan is a tool that would be used. For developments that don't contemplate subdivision, we have to treat those in a different way. And that's why we've created the issue of a site plan, which would still have to address all the same questions and that would usually precede having a designation or rezoning on the, on the land. Both, both types of uh, more detailed plans do require supporting studies, and that could be a traffic impact assessment, a wetland impact assessment, slope stability assessment. It, it does depend on the characteristics of which piece of land you're dealing with, but that is the overall process that's been put in place as a follow-up to some of the concepts and policies that I'm going to be sharing with you. The other aspect of the plan is supposed to cover is an issue of timing or phasing. Uh, the plan is expected to build out over the next 20 to 25 years. It is a long range uh, uh, vision of what would happen in the area. There is no set plan that says we're gonna start in the east and move our way to the west. It's really dependent on which landowner in the area wishes to come forward and start developing their land and convert it from agriculture use to one of the other allowable uses, prepare the detail plans that are necessary, and that most likely will be in response to whatever economic climate or uh, feasibility may be there at the time that they're thinking about doing that development. <clears throat> so the drawing that's up on the screen now is a key exhibit in the plan, the future land use concept and transportation concept. You'll find that at the back uh, of the, the document, which is up on the county's website, it's page 62. 
Uh, and this shows the geographic distribution of land uses and features uh, across the plan area that we're looking at. The boundaries uh, of some of the features are meant to be conceptual. What that means is that when someone comes to do that more detailed planning, there may be some refinement as they put in a lot more effort and do a lot more background research on the particular quarter section that they're working with. The boundaries between the residential area versus the open space area may alter the location of one of the collector roads may shift a little bit depending on what the lay of the land is. Uh, the residential category that is the, would be the yellow areas uh, across the strong that includes uh, future subdivisions and the existing subdivisions. The commercial category just identifies the one site that we have in the area now and future sites could be added as developers bring forward their proposals. The recreational category is the light brown. So we have Old McDonald's Resort, uh, both existing and the future expansion area on the far west, and the Paradise Shore site on, on the east. Uh, future ones, if there is a pro proposal for that, would have to be added, which means a change to this particular land use concept to switch to that, that category. That is a possibility. Uh, the public service site, you know, there's one over here kind of towards the east end. Uh, intended to be a satellite location for the county and the delivering uh, of uh, municipal services. And the open space area, the green areas that you see throughout are areas where, which may contain a wetland or a steep slope or areas that really are not suitable for development. They may also include areas that are purposely set aside to facilitate a trail connection or a local park. And that also includes two community park locations. You see one here in the west on a Range Road uh, 211 and another one over here in the east uh, within the south half of 20, around 10 to 12 acres in size. As the population in this area grows, there may be a need for outdoor active recreational facilities that are not related to the lake, such as soccer pitches, ball diamonds, large spot for a large playground, that sort of thing. The final two aspects that are shown on this uh, drawing are the series of uh, orange reddish dots, which communicate the desire to create a series of trails throughout the area. It could be natural trails or paved trails. The plan doesn't actually speak to that level of detail, but the, it tries to communicate the intent that if you're developing your quarter section, you're expected to make connections to up to the lake, to your neighbor's development when it happens in the future or existing development. And the final is the three asterisks that you see in the lake. And that denotes the three vehicle access points or, or boat launches, depending on your preference, uh, where the county will focus their efforts to make sure those facilities will grow and expand as demand increases from increased development within the plan area. So the next set, the general policies. So this is a set of things that apply across the entire plan area, regardless of which land use category you're in. Uh, so it includes th things such as uh, uh, preserving environmentally sensitive areas like wetlands or steep slopes, uh, avoiding encroachment on the provincially owned uh, lake right away to leave that for public access. Uh, requiring layouts of subdivisions and development to work with the natural lay of the land and not uh, take a clear cutting and flattening and level approach. So trying to work with the hills and dales as much as we can and the part to maintain existing drainage courses and tree cover, which is also the next point, retaining as much natural tree cover as you can, while recognizing that roadways and actual building sites will impact on that. And to also taking into account the need to look further into historical and archaeological resources that may be in the area given the history of Métis and Aboriginal nations. Uh, so the com some confirmation will be needed before actual digging occurs in the ground around those resources. In terms of specific land uses, uh, agriculture use is not shown on the concept drawing that was up earlier. But it is a use that's expected to continue on the ground and be there until, again, landowners are prepared to convert their land and uh, move to one of the other uses. It could also be incorporated into the design for a future residential area, leaving, say, a communal a horse paddock or a communal garden area. The, there is a restriction on agricultural activity, and that relates to confined feeding operations. Uh, the Buffalo Lake IEP and this plan both restrict uh, new confined feeding operations uh, from being pro, uh, approved in the area and existing ones cannot expand beyond 50% of their current capacity. Uh, for residential use, that could include anything from detached dwellings to small-scale multifamily. That could include permanent and seasonal houses. The preference is that when a country residential subdivision is created, that it be take a cluster form. Uh, so rather than spreading the lots across the entire quarter section, uh, concentrating in either one half or the other and being generous in the amount of open space or natural area left around the houses. 
Uh, the minimum parcel size is being set for residential new country or residential parcels is half an acre. So that is uh, pretty close to what you see in the scenic sand subdivision within the area. And again, I have the land use concept. So continuing on, uh, commercial uses, uh, as we mentioned, uh, there is only one. They could be more proposed in the future. The expectation is that the commercial in the area has some sort of relationship to the lake and the residents and the visitors to the area. So that could be a convenience uh, store, that could be a restaurant, that could be a cafe, uh, ice cream shop, those sort of things. Home-based businesses are allowed throughout the plan area and don't have to have a relationship to the lake. Recreational use is a category that encompasses uh, RV campgrounds, golf courses, amusement, game facilities. It could include resorts that have accommodation, could be another golf course. And similar if it includes uh, the idea of creating parcels for ownership, either in a bare land condo or a subdivision, the idea is to try and cluster those as opposed to uh, spread them out across the land. The public service side I mentioned is that uh, one blue spot is, uh, specific for municipal service delivery. The open space category, again, natural areas, planned parks, trail corridors. Uh, if subdivisions involved, the county is able to use what's called environmental reserve and municipal reserve to obtain uh, park dedication for areas that shouldn't be developed, that's environmental reserve or areas that are purposeful planned parks, that's municipal. If a development doesn't involve subdivision, the county can't require those sort of things. So that means on the site plan, uh, the county would have to use that as a tool to say this part of the escarpment or this natural area, or this wetland area uh, it should be left as it is and will direct the activity you're proposing in other parts of your property. Uh, and community parks I mentioned earlier are meant for those active recreational needs of the community as it grows. And again, peek at the land use concept. So one of the uh, main objectives of the South Shore Area Structure Plan is to take the number of development units that are allocated to the county for the county portion of the South Shore Growth Node and to set, put in place a system to regulate those and ration them across the area. Uh, so the Buffalo Lake IDP, the senior plan, is the one that establishes the number that's available for the county, and that's set at 2,969 development units. So a development unit uh, is a definition that's been agreed to by all the municipalities around the lake, and it includes things such as privately owned title lots or quarter section or a parcel within a country residential subdivision, the residential unit or house that's placed on the lot, uh, also a secondary suite, the campsite stalls, whether or not they're used or not, hotel or motel rooms, whether or not they're occupied or not. And for some of the individual parcels, if an individual has chosen to set up their RV for use for more than 31 days over the course of a season, that would also count as a development unit. The overall number uh, that has been assigned to the county and its relationship to the lake is documented and described in the Buffalo Lake IDP. It is based on lake capacity and maintaining a good user environment uh, based on that policy document. So we haven't repeated that detail because it's already available in that other document. Uh, the draft plan looks at how many units are already on the ground. So we've had to do an inventory as best we could to see how many, using that definition of development units, are already accounted for and determine how many are yet to be built. Uh, when we've done the math, that comes out to around 2,715 development units that we're purposely distributing through this plan which is lower than the 2969 number that's allowed theoretically under the Buffalo Lake IDP. So there is some discrepancy there that probably will be sorted out over time, but our plan focuses first on dealing with the first 2715 uh, development units in the area. The map that's up in front of you uh, basically takes the undeveloped portion of that 2715 uh, development units and distributes them across the plan area into three major groupings. Uh, and actually the fourth is the existing uh, subdivision. So I'll talk about that as well. So the first grouping is allocation area A, which is outlined in the red in the far west and left. That is Old McDonald Resort. Uh, a total of 858 development units have been assigned to that area. That represents the 458 more or less that are already on the ground. 
and a previous approval that was obtained in a concept plan to expand and add another 400 units. So 858 development units are spoken for in the far west tip. In the blue area, allocation area B, uh, a total of 524 existing and proposed developments have been assigned. And most of the existing ones are, as you can see by the drawing, largely the, the quarter sections themselves. Uh, the future would be more subdivision of course in that area. Allocation area C, which basically extends from the east side of 835, right here, all the way to the west tip of White Sands, has been allocated a total of 875 existing and proposed development units. The fourth area I mentioned is the uh, four, well, actually more than four, uh, the existing subdivision areas here, Ocean Sands Heights, Ocean Sands Estates, Buffalo Lake Meadows, et cetera. And there's approximately uh, 450 to 460 existing and future development units uh, in those areas. Most of those are existing on the ground and there's a bit of an allowance left for someone to add an RV or add a secondary suite. So we tried to take that into account as well. Within each area that you can see, so for example, allocation area B that has the 524 available, that is further broken down on a first proposed, first approved basis. So we're not setting aside a set amount for each individual landowner. It depends on when someone's prepared to come forward and start development. Their, the merits of their project will be evaluated. Council will decide how many development units they, they get. And once a outline plan or a site plan has been approved for all intent and purposes, those development units are spoken for and they've been allocated. To make sure the system works over time, the plan calls for monitoring to be undertaken by county planning staff to periodically look and see how many developed units are on the ground. And before council is presented with a proposal with a large development that uh, includes say 50 or more development units, the expectation is that county staff will give them an update on where the things stand relative to that overall cap of 2,715 development units. So moving on to additional concepts, transportation uh, network and policies is next. Uh, the overall concept is based on the grid of range roads and township roads and access, the limited access to Highway 835 and access to Highway 601. So that major grid is meant to deal with the bulk of the traffic that we expect over time in the area. It does include at least one new extension uh, in the east part of the plan area down south, uh, straight south to reach up with uh, Highway 601, which I'll show on the map in a second. It also includes a series of collector roads uh, that loop through the area, uh, like a series of, of loops and chains with the intent of providing secondary access for emergency or maintenance purposes to most, if not all of the future development areas uh, within the plan. This is the land use concept. The black lines are that grid, more or less. So you can see your township road uh, 402 here. The thick black one in the middle is Highway 835. The plan doesn't count on any new access points to 835, given the challenge in topography along that one mile stretch uh, in terms of steep slopes either side and the up and down nature of the highway to achieve a safe intersection. Over here in the far right, you can see one of two options uh, for an extension of arterial roads, either uh, Range Road or sorry, yeah, Range Road 24 or Range Road 25, straight south off the, off the drawing to connect up with Highway uh, 601, approximately two miles to the south. Then the gray lines are the collector roads that I was mentioning. And so as you can see, there's an intent to provide loops and connections as development occurs. So we have that secondary network shaping up for emergency and other uh, reasons. Another key concept that the area structure plan is expected to cover is uh, how those vehicle access points and boat launches will be managed over time to make sure that piece of infrastructure expands and is available for use of future residents uh, in the area as the area grows and expands. So the, the plan calls for focusing the effort on three locations. One's the Buffalo View Estates Marina, one's the north end of Range Road 211, and one is near Scenic Sands. Uh, each, of these plan, each of these locations uh, will require a more detailed plan to identify what can be developed and what's needed to make them function properly. That will also help identify the costs associated with uh, making those improvements, which would allow the county to then put into in place a funding plan for collections from development as development progresses, so that there's a way of uh, having the funds available to manage and expand the infrastructure as it goes. 
which of them gets going first will depend on where development lands. But the general intent is that yeah, if it's in the east area or the west area, the closest boat launch will be expanding and growing at the same time as the increased demand is happening. So the county will have to coordinate improvements of these locations with the actual development happening elsewhere on private land. So the next uh, two concepts deal with servicing. The uh, first is water uh, servicing concept. The county uh, working with the Shirley McClellan uh, Water Regional Water Commission and the other partner municipalities has extended some regional water line uh, network to the east end of the plan area. And the intent is to pull that through the area over to the west and tie into the existing uh, communally serviced areas such as Buffalo View Estates and uh, Buffalo Sands uh, in the long term. New developments as they come on, if they're close to the regional line, if the regional lines there are expected to connect pretty much right off the hop. If it's too far away or it doesn't exist yet, they could continue to use communal water systems, either a communal well or a communal cistern with local distribution that eventually would tie into the regional system when it gets there. For individual parcels like a farmstead uh, or a single country residential parcel uh, or first parcel out somewhere, uh, private wells can continue in those circumstances. So it's only multi-lot that would face the uh, requirement for use of communal systems and the uh, requirement for connection if uh, the regional line is going by. So here on the graphic, we, uh, the items that are shown in blue are part of the uh, water concept. So in the far east, you can see the existing line that's come up from the south to reach the water tr uh, truck fill station, which is located in the south end of White Sands. Uh, the next phase of development is largely this line parallel in Lakeshore to get into a, the summer village of Roshan Sands. Uh, our plan doesn't cover the summer village of Roshan Sands, so the water line goes in one end and eventually it's expected to come out the other and be able to extend further to the Buffalo Sands area. And so that's the major spine. And from there, more water lines would, would expand out or grow from reservoirs or have spur lines to go to other reservoir locations. Well, the wastewater servicing concept also relies on a future a regional uh, a municipal wastewater collection system. Uh, that'll include a series of pumps, gravity mains, and force mains, and uh, there's two options or locations for a, a water or wastewater treatment plant. Uh, until this is available, the interim arrangement of uh, trucking effluent over to the Red Willow Lagoon will continue, although eventually capacity will run out at uh, Red Willow as well. <clears throat> the, uh, the county does have to do some design and engineering work on this system to be able to one choose between which location for the wastewater treatment plant is going to go forward and also to understand the cost so that too can be looked at as development occurs as an item that the people contribute to a facility that ultimately they'll end up using one day uh, so until that system is available communal systems involving uh, typically a, a, a large holding tank can continue to be used for people that are proposing multi-lot or a multi-unit uh, type development for individual private pro uh, properties, such as again, the farmstead or the first parcel out off on its own in a quarter section, private systems of private sewage systems can continue to be used. Uh, similar to the existing policy in the Buffalo Lake IDP, any private system that's within 800 meters of the lake must either be a communal system, or if it's a private individual system, must consist of a completely sealed uh, holding tank and being pumped out largely to protect the water quality in Buffalo Lake. So again, the concept showing those ideas, uh, this time in red for the wastewater system, uh, you see a series of squares, which are the pumping loca station locations or lift stations. And then the series of pipes that would basically convey the effluent down towards the Southwest end of the plan area. And one of two options has to be selected for a location and full development of a wastewater treatment plant. And then from each of those locations, there's also two options on how to get the effluent to the Red Deer River either by pipe or by tail, uh, tail creek. And our last slide uh, deals with stormwater management, also an important aspect in terms of maintaining or protecting uh, water quality in Buffalo Lake. Uh, so every multi-lot development or large scale development that has several developments on a single parcel must provide a stormwater management plan. The design of that must meet the county's expectations as well as Alberta Environment and Parks expectations. 
Uh, so development is expected to control the increased amount of water that will come off of their property once it's developed. So that usually means in areas of storm ponds or storage areas to detain or control the flow of the water. Those ponds also have to deal with the quality of the water before it leaves the site so to clean out the worst of the hydrocarbons or other contaminants before the water ultimately makes its way to Buffalo Lake. The private utilities uh, in the plan area are intended to be underground. Uh, the overhead power along the range roads and township roads will most likely remain. But when it comes to creating a brand new subdivision such as uh, scenic sands, the expectation will be most of that infrastructure will be provided underground wherever possible. And with that, Nikki, that ends my formal presentation. Craig. Before we move into the discussion of the plan, I'll take a minute to introduce our council members who are here to listen to your questions, inquiries, and concerns. Uh, first, joining us through Zoom today is Councillor Shree Neitz. And in the room, we have Councillors James Nyberg, Les Stolberg, Wayne Nixon, Dave Grover, Ernie Gender, and among the staff here today are CAO Yvette Cassidy, Director of Municipal Affairs, Andrew Brishik, Director of Planning, Jacinta Donovan, and Planning, uh, um, sorry, Development Officer, Kara McKenzie. I think I'd know that by my third time. Uh, we, we just wanna say, oh, sorry, and finally, <laughs> Last but certainly not least, Reeve Larry Clark is with us in the front here. Sorry, Larry. Pardon? <laughs> we want to say thank you very much for joining us today. We value your input and your feedback. It's hard to hold public engagement without the public, and it is important to us that you made the time to join us today. We thank you in advance for coming this afternoon. The purpose of these sessions are to provide you with the opportunity to review the plan with Craig and with our planners, to ask questions, to seek clarification, and to make suggestions. This is not a public hearing. The information and the feedback we receive from you throughout the public engagement process will be considered by Council as they further review the draft plan later in May. Some general housekeeping before we get started. This session is being recorded. It will be uploaded on Stetler County's YouTube channel uh, beginning May the 1st, and you can refer back to it later or share it with those who are unable to attend. We are accepting feedback until Monday, May 17th. If you leave here today and have new thoughts or ideas you wish to share, you're invi invited to forward that to us by email or by calling the planning department at the County of Stetler. Now let's get going. Andrew, if you'll just walk us through the technical fun functions of today's session and then we can start taking questions. All right, yeah. So for questions through Zoom, obviously uh, everybody's muted right now, um, but we want to be able to hear from you. Um, so. Now that we're at the Q&A portion, we're going to ask you to raise your hand through Zoom to request to be unmuted and enter your com or you can enter your com comments in chat. Uh, we'll read from both and we'll try and cover everything we receive in order. Um, chat is visible to all participants. Um, there is the option to, to send it directly to us, but we prefer it just be visible to everyone so we can kind of see what's coming up. Um, as Nikki mentioned, these sessions are recorded. Uh, you'll find them in, at our YouTube page, which you can see the link on the screen now. If we have any technical issues in the middle of the presentation or in the middle of this q a we'll try and pause to resolve them we might have some silence or some dead air on our end and then if necessary uh we would reschedule this meeting if the issue can't be resolved in which case we would send a notification to everybody who's on the call with the email addresses that you guys registered so to raise your hand uh, there's a couple ways so if you're on a desktop or laptop computer you'll see there might be two options depending on the version you have. Um, so firstly, you can try clicking the participants button and you should hopefully see a raise hand button there. Uh, if you do and you click that, we'll see your hand go up and you're kept in order. And then when it's your turn to speak, we'll unmute you. You'll get a prompt to say that the host would like to unmute you and you choose unmute and then you'll be able to talk. Uh, slightly newer versions uh, have the raise hand button under the reactions button. 
if you see any reactions, raise hand, and then it's the same process where uh, we'll unmute you when it's your turn. And then on mobile and most tablets, you'll find it under the dot, 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 more button, and there'll be a raise hand option. And then from there, it's the same as everywhere else. You will uh, be unmuted by us, and then you'll have to confirm that you want to unmute so that we can catch you in the middle of a yawn. If you're on the phone uh, calling in, you didn't see any of that and it's useless to you, um, in which case you can uh, raise your hand by pressing star nine on your phone when it's your turn to speak. Uh, we'll again ask to unmute you and you'll get a, an automated prompt that says press six to confirm you want to speak and unmute. Uh, and so when you're done speaking, if you want to mute yourself before we mute you, you can press star six again to mute. Uh, and that concludes the sort of tech walkthrough. Hopefully everybody's um, Zoom is behaving and doing what uh, we expect it to. And uh, the Q&A portion is now open. If you want to raise your hand or ask questions through chat, uh, you can do so now. See no hands up yet. And that, that silence is uncomfortable. <laughs> Check mark. We have Kathy Hankins with her hand up. Perfect. So we will ask to unmute. All right. Kathy, you should see the option pop up to unmute yourself now. Okay. Can you hear me now? You betcha. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Okay. Um, when I'm looking at um, the map of the water and wastewater service concept, I'm noticing that um, these uh, lines or the water line uh, goes through my land, my son's land. Those are the only lands that I'm concerned about. Uh, what would be the compensation going forward uh, to the landowner for running uh, the lines through their property? Um, so that one's actually kind of easy. Um, the, uh, with any infrastructure improvements that they're showing the plan, this is projected based on when development occurs in those lands. So that would be uh, something that would be part of basically a road alignment that if you wanted to develop your lands further, uh, you would have to develop those roads anyway. So we would uh, aim no, to- I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not speaking about the road. I'm speaking about the water line. Yeah, so with the water line, whether it's the water line or wastewater or a road, all three of them together uh, would be as part of development. Uh, uh, as far as this plan is concerned, if we had a desire uh, to get water further west uh, sooner than development occurred, that allowed us to go along new road allowances that would be developed down in the future, um, that would be outside of the scope of this plan. Uh, and we would have to uh, find an alignment that works for that and uh, follow it. But the way the plan actually proposes right now that, that Craig's put together, is it's assuming that development would occur and we would phase the water lines through while development. Okay, I think that answers my question. Okay, thank you. So, Julie, I'm going to, oh, there it is. Oh, move just as I was about to click my. <laughs> so, you should have that option to unmute. Now, there you go. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I guess I'll get right to the, uh, uh, where am I going to here? Development unit allocation concept. Uh, Craig, I just wanted to clarify the numbers, what, where we'll end up after the fact is like area A will have 858 units, area B would have 833 total, and there'd be 990 in area C, and then there's the other uh, areas that are acreages or whatever at this point in time, is that correct? Okay, uh, I, th I think the numbers that you rhymed off uh, were correct, uh, Julie. So uh, so maybe I'll, I'll just quickly go over them again. Okay. That helps? Yep. Okay, just let me grab my correct notes. So start over here, area A, 858. Great. Uh, existing and future. Area B, 524. Plus the existing is 800. That, that accounts for the existing ones, yes. That accounts for the existing. So most of the existing ones in the area B are the large quarter sections that you can see, right? 
Oh, I'm uh, thinking, okay, maybe I've misunderstood. What's east of, of 835 and west of 835 total? That's okay, that, that number we have to break out. Yeah, so just while Craig is, is breaking that out, um, it just just one of the things to note that maybe looks a little bit more confusing is you'll notice on the, the map on page 68 that I'm sharing here, um, the existing subdivisions are outside of the allocation areas uh, because they've already yeah. been, been developed. Yeah. Yes. Okay, okay. so I, I do have my breakout now. Oh, well, thanks. Uh, so uh, approximately for if you've drawn a line using 835, sorry, so you guys can't see that one. Mm -hmm. Can you see that one, my mouse moving? Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's around 990 existing and future development units over here. Yes. 1,725 existing and future over here. Okay. And so, so you, how did you allocate that? Was it based on one third, one third, or? Uh, uh, roughly. It, it's... Um, Part of it was uh, when the existing approvals and uh, patterns had already made that decision for us. So that was a good portion of it. And then there was approximately 1,400 remaining to be allocated. So it's not a perfect one third, uh, two thirds, one third. The cognizant of the fact that on the area east of 835, we have a disproportionate amount of road infrastructure that we have to be funded somehow. So it's a little bit more of a weighting that way. So it works out to be almost more of a, I think, 36% east, 63% west. Okay. Uh, okay. I, I guess where I'm getting to is it seems, it, it doesn't sound like there was any consideration given to the quarters of land that are available to develop. Like there seems to be more area, uh, areas to be developed in area B versus area C. Was like quarter sex quarter sections available yes yeah, so we didn't go by a perfect uniform distribution based on area okay all right that that was just something that was quite noticeable in the plan uh and i wondered is it more why was that uh, flexibility over time Now you made reference to unused dwelling units. I think you talked about there was 2969, but it's been adjusted to 2715. And so there's a discrepancy there of what, 250 or something. How will they, how will the unused allocation of dwelling units be distributed? And should that be outlined in the plan? Okay. So um, first up, uh, the reason why we've indicated the County is still interested in that number. So just because we're saying 27 or 2,715 right now, doesn't mean when we work with the other partners around the lake that we're giving up that 250 or so. Correct. Uh, so we're hoping that if we work our way through the first 2,715 and see how that goes, eventually we'll have the opportunity to come up and uh, come back to this and say, how did we arrive at that discrepancy? And has anything changed over time that fine tunes that? And, and some of the discrepancy is just based on how the plans were created in the past. And it could be different area calculations. It's not that someone has done something horribly wrong. It's just sometimes when you try to relate plans done over different times with different people, you can't find these kinds of discrepancies. Okay, so. Oh, sorry, yeah. the last part of that, Julie, is that is why the monitoring as we go process is also being put in place. Okay. There's so, like a parallel case to that too. Sorry to take it up, Julie. Um, is that at this point a plan amendment would, would be required um, to utilize those additional uh, 200 blocks? Okay, so I guess where I'm getting to is would a major review of this be required if, for some reason, 300 development units become available in one area and you want to distribute them? how you're going to distribute them. Would that be made public and would there have to be a review of the plan? Okay, um, I'm not sure how they, if they become available or changes the numbers, yes, that would be one of two ways. So, uh, so first up, the plan we're putting in place isn't meant just to be, you know, set it in course and let it run for 25 years. 
Uh, so periodically things will have to be uh, looked at. I think we're suggesting in this that at least every 10 years uh, it be formally reviewed and looked at. If something comes forward that is strikingly different, as Andrew has alluded to, that could trigger a formal amendment. That too involves public con uh, uh, review and comment uh, opportunities. Okay. If council at any point in time thinks it's just not working, they too could launch a review. So if we, um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if someone says all of a sudden we have another 300 units because the group around the lake got together and amended the Buffalo Lake IDP to increase the number of available development units, then that most likely would trigger review and amendment of this plan. Okay. Okay, but I guess that's what we're looking for, that there's some sort of public engagement if it changes at yeah. all. Oh. It does, and it, it's also it's important to note that there's public engagement as it gets implemented as well. So as a landowner comes forward and says, I'm in that blue area and I wanna do a 100 lot subdivision and I've done my, my outline plan and I'm going through the rezoning process, that involves public consultation. So you're gonna be able to see how the plan gets implemented as landowners bring forward their proposals. Okay, well, that brings me to one of my questions I had was, is there a requirement for a, a, a development to do some public consultation before the actual development permit is approved? Can, is that in the land use bylaws or is that somewhere, or is it not necessary? Uh, so I'm gonna put her on the spot, but I'm gonna see, ask her just if she could feel that one. Hi, Julie. Hi. So yes, uh, the county has adopted a public engagement policy um, was a year, two years ago. So the requirement would be to uh, have some public consultation for any large scale development. Okay. So that's covered in, in another plan somewhere, is it? Uh, county policy. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. I guess the, the big thing that our area is concerned about uh, is how the wording has been defined in policy 3.39. It says that the county should ensure 50% of combined total of 1,399 units in B and C be used to accommodate detached dwellings. Mm -hmm. What I don't see there, like, I guess I'm asking why is it written that way? Because it appears that we're giving uh, the possibility of 700 development units at the old Paradise Shore site. So I'll start with that one. Um, I've got the answer that I really like and that is, um, yeah, your interpretation of that's correct is that up to 700 units could be allocated um, to uh, non-detached dwellings. The challenge with that, and I, and I respect, respect my development authority and my council not to approve such uh, and uh, development like that because if they took within area C and approved one quarter section having 700 lots, but only leave another 150 or so lots for the other five quarter sections that need to develop. And then subsequently, it also means that in development B, uh, they would have absolutely no room to approve any uh, long-term use uh, RVs. And there are some subdivisions in there that our land use bylaw currently allows RVs to be a a dwelling unit or to have multiple RVs even as a dwelling unit. Um, so that would starve the rest of area C for most development at all. And you would have, you know, where you would need six acre lots to develop the rest of it. And that's just not that business practical. Um, so we would, you'd sterilize the entire side of C. So um, they've left it that way for flexibility at this point. Uh, but of course we are, we are hearing on that a couple of times. Yeah, it, it seems coincidental that there's a developer waiting and it's been worded this way and it's first submitted, first approved, right? So whether it's this council or this development authority or future development authorities, the potential is there. And even though your intentions are that that wouldn't happen, I'm wondering if, if there would, could be some accommodation to make sure that it doesn't happen. I mean, we're right back to where we were two years ago or three years ago, right? With 700 potential. So it's, it's James Diver here, Councillor. Um, unfortunately, I, I hear exactly what you're saying, Julia, but our problem is no council 
can bind the future councils going forward. It, just as easily as we could put in stone something that is written, um, unless it is built, it can be changed. So um, going both forward and backwards, a future council, a future development authority could change whatever is going forward unless it's built. So um, i.e. a house goes up and it's already built, um, there's no way to, I mean, I mean, short of uh, court order, could you make them take that house down? Um, no matter what the new policies, it's always grandfathered in that way. But a council could come in, the next council could come in and change this area structure plan completely and nothing that this council could do could change that. Um, that is the nature of our governance body within the uh, Commonwealth of Canada and the province of Alberta. So. Yeah, I think I understand this is a concept and, 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 you know, but it's a plan that's going to be a working document for this council or future councils right and if something doesn't work sure you're going to put a, a change through I think I understand that but to start off right at the beginning, which it appears um, that you're trying to accommodate that developer with the way it's worded. To be honest, I, I will point out, Julie, that's actually a new restriction um, and actually not a new allowance, so to speak, in that the, uh, the plan that's, of course, uh, proposed to be replaced didn't uh, have any concept on restricting what could be uh, a, say, a hotel or a trailer or, or any other non-detached dwelling versus detached dwelling. So um, it's actually, you know, um, I, I definitely get where you're coming from. I know that that there's a sensitive area here where we're talking about, um, but it is with the intent of a little bit more expectation as to uh, what the maximum could be across the entire South Shore growth node, uh, rather than trying to say, okay, you know, this is what's gonna go in for a specific developer. Um, and yeah. beyond that, every development, and I think we've done a really good job, and, and I know we've talked to you specifically in the past about this, but I think we've done a really good job of taking up some of the issues uh, that we're in a land use bylaw. Um, that there is a much higher standard of review. Um, you know, I do get the the red tape words thrown at me a lot, um, <laughs> and that's not ever my intent. But I do want a decent standard of review um, so that developments are evaluated on the merits of the development itself, um, and that the issues um, that uh, that a new development brings, whether it's a campground or a new subdivision or or a you know a liquor store. That all of those are addressed holistically and, and at the same time. Mm -hmm. so. all, all I'm saying, this is all that residents have to mm -hmm. have guidance. And I'm just, I'm just not confident that this wording um, meets what your taxpayers are wanting. That's all. I, I'm just saying, is there some way that we could look at this together and figure out a different way to word it that still gives you the flexibility, but at, but uh, knowing what you know about the development in that area, there's no sense hiding behind it, it's there, right? Um, for it not to be 700 units. That, that, I think that's all that we're looking for. And I, and I think this wording is, is, is kind of... Julie, it's Larry Clark speaking. Uh, Julie, this is, is how we looked at wording. This is the reason we're sitting here is to listen to people's uh, concerns and reasoning and then the council itself is going to have to make that decision after so it okay. this is the way it is worded now we've, we've heard your concern on it okay and uh but go forward it will be up to council to discuss and absolutely how we will go through okay we do have a couple other hands up julie if i can go ahead the back of the line for now but if you have other stuff later definitely bring it up um i will start with uh with daryl Getting too many buttons. There we go. There we go. How's that? Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, my question is with regards to Area A. Um, there's 400 units allocated to Old McDonald for future development. Um, my question is, is with regards to that, if Old McDonald, and it's a small area if you look at it, if Old McDonald um, decides through a business plan, decides not to build the additional 400 units, 
Uh, what happens to those units in the future? Uh, how are they distributed? How are they transferred across to the maybe other areas? Um, uh, are they permanently there or do they disappear at some point? Um, the, the concern I have is that you could essentially make a business deal with the um, owners of Paradise Shores and transfer 400 undeveloped units over to that property and uh, end up with potentially 700 units out there. So how do you handle that? How do you restrict it? Well, that's a, that's a really good question, Daryl, um, and actually really apt. So uh, I'm, I'm going to have a long way to answer, I'm sorry. Um, I start with the fact that why, why we put area A in there as one we don't separately from area B to start with is because they had an existing outline plan uh, that's, that's a little dated now, for sure, uh, that approved 400. And we wanted to, to pay respect to the fact that the council had approved those developments to go on the ground. But um, in some early discussions we've even had with them, they said, yeah, we don't know that that's really going to be the way our business goes. Um, so actually engaging with them in, during this plan is going to help us shape that. So there's a good chance that that changes uh, before we give this first reading. Um, if the plan went into place exactly as it's written right now, those units are stuck no matter what they do. Um, so effectively, you would say it would be the, those units would be off the table. They'd only be developable on those two quarter sections. Uh, and we, we'd lose them to the ether if, if nobody wanted to do anything with them. Um, which is why we've gone with uh, the format we have in the rest. And you know, Old McDonald's was an exception because of the existing approval, but for B and C, having a, having a wider area where those developments were able to be allocated, but still um, give some decent expectations, gives us the flexibility so that we're not relying on a specific development um, to succeed or fail. Uh, when realistically, we, we want to have that flexibility, as I said before, to improve things based on the merits. So um, I expect that council will have to do some work on uh, what they'll want to do there. Maybe A and B end up getting merged. Um, it's, it's really going to depend on exactly what we hear from, uh, from the McDonald's. Uh, and if they're willing to formally give up their existing approval, uh, that makes this a lot easier to do. There, um, there's still a concern that uh, there's no time frame on, on when they would build or build out at old McDonald's. So um, there, that's a large number of units that could be distributed across to the other areas, B and C. And it's um, something that is concerning. How would you handle the larger transfer of that distribu distribution across to the other areas? Yeah, so um, that we basically we need to make that decision now or the next time we amend the plan. Um, as soon as it's allocated to an area, it has to be allocated to an area through this by through bylaw adoption. So if we did it today and then needed to redistribute it five years from now, say, well, McDonald's says, well, I want to hang on to it right now. Uh, but then five years later, they come back and they say, well, no, we like the size we're at. We're not, we're not going to grow that big. Uh, we would have to do another plan amendment. Um, and that would involve the same sort of public hearing uh, and the public engagement. So we'd be back at the table to decide how to do it. Um, regardless, if we, if we make some changes to what's presented today, um, that will still come out to the public as part of this public engagement uh, before we give the, the bylaw first reading. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so next we will go to Peter Wood. Go ahead, Peter. Can you hear me? You betcha. All right, thanks very much uh, for the opportunity to, to sit in on this with you guys. Um, I see the we're presenting this new ASP as kind of a long term plan for the area, but um, I'm just kind of wondering what's in place to make sure that the growth doesn't outpace the infrastructure, you know, as far as roads, boat launches, doctors, EMS, all that kind of stuff. If we all of a sudden plop a several hundred unit uh, development in place. Um, you know, is the infrastructure going to be there to handle it? And is there any limitations on that? So that's a, a, another good question. Um, the, the ASP itself doesn't speak to phasing. Uh, that's specifically something that's, that's not included in it. We're not going to say that 
you know, this property needs to be built before that property is allowed to build. Um, some area structure plans absolutely speak to that, but uh, we really, I mean, this will be a slow, slow enough development as it is. You know, you, we've all seen the rate the lake grows at. It's, it's steady, but it's not, it's not light speed. So we just need developer interest. Um, so that's why we're, we, we haven't phased anything. As for sort of the, the extra bits and pieces um, aren't typically uh, handled under an area structure plan and maybe I see Craig is unmuted. And Craig, can you speak a bit to that and, and how sort of the, the non-municipal services and phasing would be considered? Um, certainly. First, uh, Andrew, we're going to speak to the municipal component. Uh, that would be a key question at the time of doing that local area structure plan and outline plan is where are we at for the project, how big is the project, and what is the nature of the infrastructure necessary, and what has to be built for phase, the first part of that development, second part, et cetera. So that is the, the main follow-up mechanism for the municipal infrastructure. When it comes to the global infrastructure that's outside the municipality's control, uh, that's where the groups like AHS have to monitor growth globally within the region and make determinations for capital plans and resource allocations. Uh, so that certainly is out of the uh, jurisdiction or scope of a municipal plan. Uh, in terms of some of the other offsite services that are within the scope of the county, let's use fire service uh, example, the county council does have to look at that on an overall community basis. So we don't find the answer in one particular plan, like an area structure plan in one corner versus the other corner of the county. But you would find that most likely in the servicing plan for that department uh, for the delivery of that critical service. Uh, Peter, Larry Clark here. Another another part of that, like you did mention the, the other services, of doctors, EMS, fire. Uh, those numbers that you're talking about for the expansion of the residence, at least through development permits, we have an understanding of what we would have for people up there, you know, in the summer and when given uh, through, you know, a, a steady population. But uh, the surge population up there does bother all of us. We've had a lot of conversations about that. Is how many people do we actually have in the lake? So maybe, uh, you know, we, we can get further insight on that also because, you know, we've heard numbers, everything from, you know, thousands of people at the lake on, on the weekend. So uh, I guess with boat launches too, Craig has mentioned other sources of where maybe boat launches could be, but that's a process we have to work through with uh, government agencies on where we put boat launches and how we put boat launches in. So, and they also have a conversation on how many boat launches you need and how much money it is. So, um, it is all things that are part of this plan. It's recognized that, you know, with, the, with expansion, it, it could be required. But as far as our emergency services, that's part of our emergency management plan. And that's every area, every community is involved in that. And, but we need to have true numbers to actually know what we should be expecting in the summertime. So um, it's, that's 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 conversation we've had quite a bit at our council table. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Good to hear that that's been in consideration. I guess my main concern really was, uh, um, you know, apart from that, so like Bayview Street uh, becoming arterial road and and boat launches, right? You know, also even if it's just you know three hundred lots in one area, well, that's going to hit that launch in that area hard and that road in that area hard. So you know, just thought to you know make sure that that stuff is upgraded before it's it's overwhelmed. I just want to add that. Um, yeah, I was trying to speak, but your mic doesn't seem to be working. I just wanted to add that uh, prior to being able to complete the uh, um, South Shore Area Structure Plan, we also did uh, minor amendments in Buffalo Lake IDP. At that time, we really um, flushed out the development units and what they were. And I think we were all kind of living in, a, you know, kind of the uncertainty of not knowing how many people are at the lake, and that's still a possibility. But I think we're on the road to having more accurate numbers by keeping track of, um, you know, extra suites and mother-in-law suites and rooms above garages, whether they're used all the time or not. It gives us an idea of the potential of how many people can be at the lake, and they've been included in the development unit count. So instead of counting. Um, house and a garage with a suite on top of it as one, we now count that as two. And that goes a long way to, uh, to know what the lake can handle, what infrastructure is in place, uh, EMS, fire, everything. So I think we've uh, taken really good first steps and we'll, we'll keep working towards that. Yeah, and to speak specifically to, to your comment about uh, how, you know, 
putting a, a development is going to impact the local resources more. That's absolutely true. That's absolutely how we look at it. Um, whereas we'll have, you know, sort of two ways of collecting it. We might, through development permit, development agreement, require direct upgrades to a road, um, or we may have an offsite levy bylaw uh, that will require for, you know, roads that are further away from the development or not on site of development um, contributions to those upgrades. Um, and so there's, you know, there's ways that we can, especially for when you consider that there's already residents out there, so there's taxpayers involved, and then there's new developers getting benefits, uh, and there's future developers getting benefits. We, we have to kind of marry up those three revenue sources and say, you know, everybody's a little bit responsible to, for this upgrade to the boat launch kind of thing, rather than putting it all on the existing taxpayers and without trying to put it on the one developer who happens to hit the trigger of, okay, I'm the one who now has to pay for the whole boat launch upgrade or a whole new boat launch because I just, you know, there were 699 and the threshold was 700 and I want to, you know, so we, um, there, there's uh, a, a decent amount of work that goes into preparing those estimates. And so that's, those are some of the next steps in uh, our phasing is the detailed infrastructure studies. Uh, to determine what the cost of the boat launches will be and upgrades to them, what the cost of wastewater systems will be, uh, what the cost of the water systems will be. Uh, and, like, and luckily, we're already making good progress on some of those, um, but there's still work to be done. So uh, it does have to be considered a time of development as well. Plus, the, uh, the boat launch sites that have been identified in the uh, South Shore Area Structure Plan were also identified in the Buffalo Lake IDP. And so it's been a process and it's been evolving, but they've been identified for a very long time. Right, and that's gonna be by my next comment was, you know, the, the roads and stuff like that can be fairly speedy in upgrading, um, but the boat launches are a whole different beast altogether. You know, we wanna do a big development or even a modest development in one area that's gonna hit that one launch hard. Um, I mean, I'm not 100% positive, but my feeling is that that can take a very, very long time to get all the approvals and, and be able to have a launch upgraded. Yeah, you're right. Well, launches are probably our slowest upgrade because of the amount of external approvals involved, for sure. Yeah. Has any work been done in pursuing that avenue? Uh, not yet, because of course we, um, we're just uh, proposing this plan. Um, so while those have been up or identified in the past with no development to the west on those improvements necessarily being required, uh, we haven't, haven't made any submissions to AEP because unfortunately they don't like to waste their time as they put it. Um, and so they're never going to give us answers on something that's not a plan in front of them and a proposal. So it, we're, we're working on a relationship with AEP and we're working through um, a lot of those sort of bureaucracies that have challenged us in the past. Um, to be able to have more uh, future-minded planning conversations rather than immediate, okay, we've got something to put in front of you with an engineer stamp on it, uh, but it's an evolution, for sure. Right. Yeah, I see that being oh, the hardest part is, you know, well, we want to do this development, but yet uh, it's going to be several years before that goes through and, and the boat launches. I mean, normally it's not an issue, but you hit a weekend, never mind a long weekend, and the lineups are already unbelievable. So, um, yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, you taking my questions. Gotcha. All right, we'll move back to you, Julie. You should have the prompt to uh, unmute yourself again. Hi, thanks. Just on that uh, boat launch, uh, I, I believe in the plan you assigned one marina for every 700 dwelling units. Um, I'm just going by White Sands and, and Roshan Sands Marinas, which is were the ones that I are most familiar with. I mean, there's only, well, White Sands has 450 approximately dwelling units with a double marina and they're already overwhelmed. How did you get to the uh, one marina for every 700? Is that, I don't know how that. I I, I'm going to give that one to Craig because uh, he's got all the good math. Okay. In some ways, uh, that's just how the numbers worked out in terms of focusing on the three. Uh, so the, the two on the west side, one on the east side, kind of corresponds to that 36, 63% distribution. The fourth one that we don't show on the map is the old McDonald's resort uh, boat launch, which although it's private and the AAP expects any new ones to be public, uh, that still takes some of the pressure off. And that's like a about a quarter of the total development units in the few, you know, sorry, uh, or like closer to a third 
of the future development units. So it wasn't a, um, an attempt to say we need one perfectly for every 750. That's just how the numbers, generally speaking, work out. The other aspect is uh, when we look at the White Sands boat launch, it's not exclusively the White Sands 400 or so units that are using that. Right. That too is public and it's open to the broad public. Uh, and that's not to say that future users from that's in the county area won't gravitate to those and vice versa. Just like everyone can still use the provincial boat launch up in the provincial park. And the Ro uh, Roshan Sands Marina launch is still a public one as well. And once the, if the county builds one of any, well, one of the three is already there, uh, builds the other two boat launches, uh, my expectation is AEP will still apply that open to the broad public use aspect uh, rule. So not to the exclusive use of the people that reside in the county portion of this plan. That's, uh, that's the underlining meaning behind boat launches in the Buffalo Lake IDP. I'm probably not wording that correctly, but that's the drive behind the Buffalo Lake IDP that every boat launch up there is public. Yes, yeah. Okay, I just wondered if that was mandated somewhere or, or what it was an arbitrary number, that's all. Um, just on the water servicing, we've had some people mention that the wording of policies 4.6.1, 0.12 and point, point 13 is, is a little bit confusing. Um, I think the question is, will existing uh, septic tank holders be required to, or uh, to hook into wastewater when it becomes available or uh, water system? Well, ultimately, both of those are decisions of council when they roll those out. This, the area structure plan is really more focused on the new development and how that infrastructure goes into place. Um, the council's gone with various approaches in the past going back decades. So, you know, I can't commit that to you at, at this point one way or the other. Uh, given, you know, some of the concerns we've had with effluent, you know, I would want to, to personally lobby government that if they had a wastewater system, that it would be mandatory to connect. Right. Um, that's, a, that's a ways out, though. Whereas water systems, it really depends on the type of system we put in. For example, what we're putting in this summer, or what the Sherman Public Commission is putting in this summer, is just a transmission line that's going to connect uh, white sands to ocean sands. And there, there's no real good way to force a person to connect to that, because that also have to force you to put a cistern in your basement if you can't have a basement and a whole bunch of other things. Whereas if we brought forward a distribution system that's more urbanized, um, the cost econ economics of it might mandate that council make that decision prior uh, to financing to say, uh, how are we going to utilize the system uh, and see if they require a connection. So um, I, I can't answer that and this plan doesn't answer that nor does it attempt to. So. Okay, so, okay. It would be cited, be decided at the time it got, it was being put in. Is that it? Yeah, exactly. And those are decisions that we would want council to make prior to committing to build the system, of course, as well. So, uh, and it typically follows into the financing discussions, is um, because it, it's part of determining the value. Because if you've got uh, uncertain hookup potential to a water line, for example, you don't know what the value of putting that water line is and what the maintenance costs are going to be for flushing it if there's not enough people on it, for example. Uh, but then the other side is a lot of people, you know, got to get well, you know, you don't want the water in their skin. We didn't force people to hook up when we put a distribution system throughout, for example. Okay. Really, it's uh, James Iver again. And again, that would be something that would be done with um, uh, extensive public consultation. So um, we would go out and survey to see who's interested in it first. And um, it would come with uh, some grant money, hopefully from the province. So we would be looking at some of the rules that are dictated to us by um, our overlords in the uh, provincial um, realm. So that being said, you either way, both wastewater and um, water uh, servicing would be done in a consultation process. It isn't something that's going to you're not going to wake up one morning and find us digging a hole into your house and pop it on there. Okay. A quick question just on, um, thanks, James. Just a quick question on buffering policy. I, there was a lot in the social and the Buffalo Lake Social IDP about the requirements for subdivisions or developments to have buffers, and that's not in this plan. Is that covered elsewhere under county bylaws? Go ahead, uh, 
So yes, Julie, that would be something that would be addressed as part of our land use bylaw and the requirements for new developers to provide the screening. And our, uh, like an area structure plan would also identify areas for offering or concept plan, whichever is required, dependent on the type of development proposed. So it's not. Uh, so is that defined in your land use bylaws or is it just up to you as the de as the development authorities to decide on that? There are provisions of what types of uh, screening, landscaping. Okay. I can uh, Perfect. give you the sections of the bylaw if you like, but yeah, there are certainly provisions on adequate screening or buffering between different types of development. Okay, as long as it's covered somewhere else, that's okay. And one, one last question I have, and then I'm gonna be quiet. <laughs> um, the Buffalo Lake IDP at 3.1.8 requires that all open space um, uh, be designated MR or ER, and is map A going to have that? Uh, well, it doesn't say that. The, it, the Buffalo Lake IDP says the approximate amount and location of land within the growth nodes to be dedicated as ER and MR must be determined during the preparation of the growth note plans as outlined in section 4.3.1. So are you going to actually outline that on map A, what's MR and ER? I don't think specifically we would be making the distinction between them um, as far as uh, what's municipal reserve versus environmental reserve. Um, and as well at this point, the. Uh, uh, the general areas that are shown, as Craig mentioned, are subject to a lot of uh, detailed change. Um, so once once we get into the uh, site plan or outline plan or local area structure plans for a proposed development or subdivision, uh, that's when the actual uh, rubber will hit the road when it comes to saying this shall be ER, this shall be MR, uh, and then some issue, some places might need, need to be public utility lots to service uh, water, wastewater systems, et cetera. Okay, so you're leaving it up to when the development happens, where the Buffalo Lake IDP seems to require it when you make up a growth node plan. Or am I misinterpreting that? We might have to get back to you on that one, Julie, and just re-review that. But I think Jacinta's got some, some more points. Yeah, Julie, for the Municipal Government Act uh, allows the county for municipality to take 10% of the total area for municipal reserve or environmental reserve. And the South Shore Area Structure Plan does uh, reflect the requirements of the Buffalo Lake IDP with just 30 meters setback from the provincial right away for uh, any development adjacent to the lake. I know our uh, lake adjacent properties adjacent to the lake are very limited at this time, but there is a requirement to provide the 30 meter setback in the current uh, area structure plan as well. Okay. I don't think we can uh, designate areas until we actually have a development brought forward to uh, have that area designated for, like Andrew said, public utilities. There's uh, certain percentages of the total area that are used for those types of uh, designations. Okay. I'll maybe follow up on that and just uh, look at the Buffalo Lake IDP. Yeah, I do know that too, just so thanks very much, yeah. Okay. So on that note, uh, Andrew, if I may, uh, certainly I think we've got the location of the intended environmental and some of the municipal reserve shown. Uh, one of the things is the challenge of this level of detail is there may be additional MR, I do expect more to show up. Uh, environmental reserve, uh, they, the boundaries may change. So probably in terms of the actual quantity, could we provide one? Yes, we could, but it's very difficult for us to split exactly which piece is environmental and which mm -hmm. piece is a municipal reserve at this point. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Craig. All right. So I've got one question in the chat here that I'll go to, and it just says, because uh, it's a quick one, I don't see the White Sands boat launch in the drop plan where the suspected users of this launch. And I think we kind of touched on it a bit. So uh, it's not included in the plan. We don't have a star there because we're strictly looking at what's within the county lands and the White Sands boat launch is within the Summer Village municipal boundaries. Uh, and then who's expected to use this launch or any of the launches? Uh, the entire public, uh, as we were 
we touched on briefly, no, no uh, public boat launch is expected to be uh, allowed for any sort of private use, whether that be private to a set of residents or private to a development. Um, so we expect white sands, Buffalo View Estates, Buffalo Lake Meadows, and scenic sands approaches just to be used by everyone, uh, as well as Roshan Sands in the provincial park. So um, I hope that answers that question. And then moving on, we'll go to Daryl. Yeah, my question is with regards to the, uh, again, we're talking about boat launches here. Uh, looking towards the future here, uh, discussion from uh, Craig was that there could be ultimately four or 5,000 people in the area. Uh, certainly the number of boats is uncertain. Um, we've identified the boat launches, but the question comes up as far as a long-term plan for um, boat users, is, is there a provision or any way we can write into the plan um, for uh, the level of discussion or, uh, or the level that, of development that would trigger discussions with the province with regards to creating uh, a marina plan, um, you know, multiple marinas, one large marina, something that would uh, prevent uh, proliferation of uh, docks and uh, boat lifts on Crown land, uh, prevent the conflict between um, beach users and, and potentially uh, land, uh, offsetting land uh, as well. So what provision are you applying for, for that kind of a, a plan in, in here? Well, that's actually kind of a, a challenging one. Um, you got really good questions. Um, that's a challenging one because uh, the provisionally owned right of way sort of mostly falls outside of our jurisdiction. Uh, and so, for example, you'll see that uh, just uh, a week ago or, or a little bit more, the uh, province approved a new mooring policy and, and just released that. And we're, in fact, we're still digesting it. We haven't actually undertaken a full review of what it means, um, but they're not really going the direction you're suggesting. Um, so it's, you know, it's less of a, an option at this point for us to be applying for communal uh, marinas. I suppose that might relieve some of the pressure, but there's no ability for us to uh, implement prohibitions against uh, private docks um, being utilized, even, even uh, for semi-private or semi-waterfront owners, which would be people who are adjacent to environmental reserves. So uh, there's just a, a, a fair bit of approval process given to the lakefront owners. Um, so we're still working through that. Um, so that might be a separate discussion, a separate set of lobbying. Um, so I don't see it uh, going into the plan, um, but it's something I think we're all kind of working with uh, um, with our municipal neighbors. I know the Buffalo Lake management team has a meeting here coming up uh, in mid-May and I uh, suspect that that will be their hot topic is the new mooring policy, and, and it'll really come back to a lot of the things we're thinking about right now. Uh, but I don't foresee that uh, uh, being included in this plan. Uh, the other, and then the other reason I don't, I don't look at boat capacity as much in this plan and just boat access uh, is because the Buffalo Lake IDP really wants to handle the boat capacity, which makes a lot of sense because there's, uh, there's five people involved in that plan and it's everybody who borders the lake, um, not a lot of, Good. we can do trying to limit boats if cameras and the phone weren't on board and just said have at her um and then they just go across the lake right we all know we've got the best side of it so um <laughs> we uh yeah so sorry sorry for a bit of a roundabout answer but i, I think right now uh provincial lobbying although that's got some comments well i just think with the boring policy um i mean if we're still looking at it we're going to be working with our community associations and our residents on it right now it's kind of status quo or the same as it was last year but i also think that the way the mooring policy is set up, it gives each municipality kind of their own exclusive way of what they decide they want to do. So, you know, like we'll work with our community associations, the residents, White Sands will work with theirs, and Russian Sands will work with theirs and decide what's best. Seems like we may have less options just on, on review. They might have walked back on some of their original. I read it the other night, and I, you know, I, it's, it's different, but. Okay. Yeah, I just I just like to raise the point that, you know, as far as future development goes, that has to be thought of uh, well in advance of, um, you know, people using the lake, um, bringing boats in and 
uh, you know, to cr- prevent any kind of conflict, you know, let's, let's be honest here. Uh, the two don't go together, uh, beach users, boat users, um, you know, we got to make sure that there's no conflict between people. For sure. And, and like I said, we'll, we'll keep working through that, uh, both the Warren policy and then, then our other issues. And then as well, I wanted to think to consider as well for, uh, you know, docking systems, for example. Um, of course, one of the challenges with that is just uh, the logistics of the municipality handling it. Um, whereas uh, community associations uh, and, and other groups like that can get uh, license for occupations of the group, develop communal systems like that, um, which may be the, the, the best fit for effectively doing it and getting boosts on the ground that, you know, pull more boats towards a common location. Uh, and we have seen some systems like that go out along the South Shore, uh, and they work very well managed by the, the community associations. Great, thank you. We have a chat question that just came in. It says, uh, it's from Christopher Martin. I had to step away briefly. Am I to understand that the Paradise Shores could still go ahead with 700 development units? I didn't see those 700 development units included in the plan. So yeah, we can rehash that one just a little bit. It's the, uh, uh, the 700 units is theoretically a possible upper, that's the upper limit to what a single campground could have anywhere in the plan. Um, it would then eliminate a ton of development around it. So it's not something that would be advisable. Um, and uh, council did hear some comments from uh, Julie just now uh, and some comments uh, on some of our previous nights around potentially altering that language uh, to put in more general restriction. But right now it was a, a group 700 units uh, that could be, and actually that's not just uh, campgrounds, that's any non-detached uh, dwelling. So uh, uh, condos or hotels or motels would all sort of fall into that uh, general uh, number. So that's the total for any of those, including individual trailers that are, are through subdivision. Okay, thank you. Well, we're at three o'clock right now. We still have half of an hour marked up for this. If there's any other questions, I see Julie's hand go up. Is there anybody else? Oh, so Julia, hit the ask to unmute on you. So I see your hand up, but it hasn't, I haven't unmuted you. I'll try one more time. Oh, there you go. Go ahead. Sorry to, I, I don't want to take over this, but I just wanted to talk about the Ontario Road, uh, Bayview Street, which I know has been talked about at other sessions. So if other people have comments, I would appreciate that. I don't want to be the only one talking. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering, uh, is it your intention to make that an arterial road? Is that what your intention is? Bayview Street? By I think Sure. Big things that we that that we've heard is and, or that we've grown to understand is that we need to define what what we mean by an arterial road. Um, and if you ask Rick, he's probably going to answer something about the subsurface of the road, uh, and much less about the surface and traffic patterns and speed limits. Um, he wants something that can handle the capacity on the road. Um, and so uh, we did identify this Tuesday night. We talked a lot about uh, you know a definition was put forward from what uh, the city of Calgary uses as an arterial road definition, which is a you know, multi-lane road with a speed limit of up to 80 kilometers an hour. Uh, this is not what we in, imagine there, I don't think. Um, so I do think you'll see some more uh, refinement as to what that means. Um, as for the uh, policies in the ESP around arterial roads, uh, there's a few of them in there that, you know, indicate. So for example, that portion of Bayview Street, um, just like the north side, the south side won't see any driveways come directly if that's designated as an arterial road and that that would be similar with all the arterial roads so that it would be local and local collector roads that get moved around yeah i think it's the definition of an arterial road the red deer county guidelines are saying that it's will take volumes up to twelve thousand cars a day the right of way is 40 meters um you know that's a big road 
And Julie, it's James Nyberg again here, and you're absolutely right. And in that definition, a lot of them is multi-lane, um, multi-lane functional road. And we have definitely, that is a note that we've taken away from this, that we have to um, clarify our definition of what we mean by arterial road. And um, so it, it's more about functionality for us when we talk about it more than the definition that is used multi-lane 50 to 80 kilometers an hour. That isn't the intent um, at all for us. It is about functionality of it. So um, okay. going forward is what we're looking at. We're not looking at turning it into a highway. That's good. <laughs> but what do you expect your functionality to be to get people from one from White Sands out uh, to get have a secondary access for us? Uh, what is your what are you perceiving as the functionality of that road? Um, Councillor Nixon has a comment. Hi, Julie. Hi. What, we're, what we're looking at, and what we've been aiming for for several years now uh, on the advice of the fire departments and emergency service is to have a ingress and egress uh, from the South Shore there. Uh, that we looked at as very important. So that is, a, in my opinion, is the main functionality of this road. Mm -hmm. And for the good of everybody that lives along the South Shore, it's, it's, uh, we realize that the, uh, the increased traffic, traffic could be a problem. Maybe there's something we can do to, to help that. Mm -hmm. Or, or whatever but uh, yeah. and I think, uh, I think everyone there is working really hard to address some of the traffic calming uh issues that we've brought up you know I think we're all working really well together on that I think it's just the definition collector road we're okay arterial road <laughs> it just raises uh some alarm bells that's all you know there I think our our now it's an outdated definition because it's got our whole logo on it uh, but our, I think our policies define an urban arterial road within our own uh, county as a 30 meter road top and a maximum of 60 kilometers. Now, I'm not saying that Bayview Street would be a 60 kilometer road, but just to illustrate how between the city of Calgary definition, the city of Red Deer, the county of Red Deer and our own definitions, um, arterial road definitely just, it's like an artery. It transports more than our veins do. Um, it's not that it's necessarily a certain size. And uh, Craig, you've made note of that, I'm sure. You've heard this a couple of times through our meetings now, so yes. I, I have, but I'm also not the designated note keeper, so I'm sure they have that recorded <laughs> as well, so. Pass the buck, gotta pass the buck, Craig. Oh, I'm gonna share it, I'm gonna share it. <laughs> We've got it. You've identified range roads uh, 204 and 205 as possible arterial roads also. Have, have you guys looked at, um, 205 and and what the possibility of that is or does it make sense that it it's probably going to be 204 because it already goes to 601 yeah there's going to be and this came up the other day too and it's it's probably going to be a, a number of factors cost is always going to be part of it um, the amount of development we have that all contribute towards it uh, but uh yeah i mean Traffic pattern wise, it looks at first glance like it might remove a little bit more traffic away from residential first. Um, but it, we left both options open um, so as not to bind the hands in case that didn't work out. And we do have to get all the way to 601, and neither of them are particularly easy um, or, or uh, inexpensive to do. Um, otherwise, I would have loved to have done them already because um, those would be great ways to get even more. Because, of course, right now, even you know, you're still mostly focused on 835, and we've all been on 835. It would be a lot easier if we had an, another good route to 601. Um, so we're we're keenly aware of that for sure. I'm just really concerned what happens to our residents at that corner where, uh, well, Christopher, Chris, and Martin lives there now. That took over that bought Ed and Viv's house and the Germans and and all the people at that corner, if 205 was uh, an option, that would really impact them if that if that was 205 was an arterial road, what kind of intersection would have to be built there? Yeah, and the, the challenge is that's gonna be true of a lot of spots though. Right now, we it's really easy to look at the ground on what's there today, um, but when you consider the, you know, the, the Southeast 20, so what would be directly south of, 
of Paradise Shores is that one day that'll be residential too. And we'll similarly have, you know, the arterial road either way, there's a big, you know, probably a big intersection right by the way. I mean, yes, right now we've got the benefit of saying, um, well, at least we know that we're planning ahead, we're planning further into the future and we can require a developer to offset from that road and to, to plan around those residences uh, knowing what's coming. But um, it's it's just worth keeping in mind that unfortunately our materials need to go past residents and get deeper into the lake. Okay. All right. I appreciate your time there. Thanks. <laughs> Go ahead, Kathy. Okay. Um uh, years ago, I had the privilege of sitting on a uh, uh, with a group doing a study on the wastewater of the south shore of Buffalo Lake. I'm sure Jacinta, you have that um, those uh, uh, that plan in your in in your archives there, maybe or maybe it's even being some of it's being used now. Uh, I think about the only councillor that was is, that is still around now that was uh, in the loop was uh, Councillor Grover uh, when we took a look at, um, at, at the what would happen with the wastewater. I had the privilege of going uh, along the south shore of uh, Slave Lake to the communities of Wagner, Widewater and um, Canyon Creek. On the south shore of their uh, lake there, uh, in those um, villages or hamlets, they put in digesters at each, um, digesters were put in at each resident. And um, I believe it was at each residence. And then the, the effluent from those digesters went into a pipeline that went on down to Canyon Creek uh, where it went through a wastewater treatment facility and I got a tour of that facility. From there, the wastewater was put into a wetland and was assimilated back into Slave Lake. Now I realize Slave Lake is a much larger lake than Buffalo Lake, uh, but I was um, wondering if that would not possibly be a less expensive option for uh, the county to look at than piping water all the way back to the Red Deer River or effluent back to the Red Deer River. And um, along with that, my previous question about um, uh, the water lines coming across, um, since you're bringing the water ac across to Roshan Sands uh, area, possibly this summer, um, I was guess I was just assuming that soon you would be putting the water line through then over to uh, Buffalo Sands um, for a station over there. Is is that correct? Well, uh, uh, we'll take your questions in reverse order just so that I remember them. I'll start with the Buffalo Sands water. I really want to get there, but it's not going to happen immediately. Um, the Shirley McClellan line coming to Roshan Sands is really great and grant funded through the commission. Uh, but once it hits Roshan Sands, it's, uh, well, once it gets into Roshan Sands, it's gonna end there. And that'll pretty well be the end of the help we have from the commission. Uh, from there, we're gonna be on our own to find some grant money or other money to take it further west. I, I wanna get the whole lake service because I love water, but um, I might not see the whole lake service or at least not with water and wastewater before I retire. And, Unfortunately, that's still a long time away. <laughs> so um, we are looking at very long-term plans at this point. Uh, yeah. You want to talk about the wastewater? Yeah. Uh, just on the wastewater, Kathy, when it says it would go to the Red Deer River, it doesn't mean you would pipe it all the way to the Red Deer River. It would get into uh, systems that flow into the Red Deer River. So uh, it would that would have to be approved where you where you release lagoons or whatever to go into that system. So it, uh, it's not like we have to run a water uh, pipeline all the way back there. We do have one challenge too. We we cannot. I believe the Buffalo Lake IDP specifically prohibits uh, the discharge of even treated effluent into 
uh, Buffalo Lake or probably even into uh, waters feeding into Buffalo Lake. Um, so that's definitely something we, we wouldn't be able to, to imitate Slave Lake in that regard. Uh, but certainly we do want to look at all of the options that are available as we move forward for the treatment. You know, a lagoon might not be what we build. It might be a, a treatment plant. It might be, uh, there, there's a lot of options now um, and some really cool technology actually. So um, we don't, yes. yeah, we, we're, we're not saying that we just dig a hole and pump into it. Uh, we're we're going to do a better job than that. Regardless of what you do, it's where you release it. Yeah, that's true. Well, I was um, thinking also from time to time when you uh, go past the barley plant there, you will see um, effluent from there. I mean, it's not sewage, but it is a byproduct of their um, plant over there being um, uh, used for irrigation out on, uh, on hayland, etc. cetera. Uh, so I was also wondering if that might not also be an option if the water has been treated and is deemed to be safe. So uh, just some thoughts I had. Yeah, looked at that plan, Kathy, back in 2006, 2007. Associate Engineering put it together. We were looking at uh, a lagoon with two aerobotic cells that would um, go into the Tail Creek. Um, we have those plants. There's lots of alternatives, but I remember back then, even when the grant money was available, it was it was pegged at four million dollars. So yeah. at today's rates, you know, we're probably looking at ten. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I guess the only thing too, as far as using it for irrigation water, some of that has to be incorporated, so that would be all through Alberta environment too, like human newer waste that has to be in a lot of cases incorporated, whereas the waste from that plant would be more of a plant process waste. Yeah. Well, we could all go to, uh, we could all go to the Beyond Belief Burgers. <laughs> I guess so. <clears throat> you can, but I can't, sorry. <laughs> Just not in my nature, Kathy. <laughs> uh, okay, we have uh, some comments in our chat from Neil, Milne, and Andrew, I think you should just take it and answer them. It, some of them are comments and maybe some of them you can talk to. Yeah, so uh, in case you're on a device, you can't really read along in the chat. Uh, the, the comments and sort of questions are, uh, in summary, this proposal package, the following areas require further detailed definition prior to the next distribution, uh, including marine mooring, land access, parking and road access. Uh, better definition on ER locations, a phasing plan that includes build out and financing for each phase. And someone needs to ask how many lots they've allocated for Paradise Shores. This is not providing them this meeting. So we'll just kind of touch on those points. So the, the first section, the marine mooring and land access or the lake access, I think it's uh, alluding to there. Um, th those are unfortunately outside of the scope of the plan as we were talking about, but we are working through that um, both independently and with our neighbors on what uh, beach access uh, and the impact of private boat docks will look like. Uh, for sure, that's that's outside of this plan and, and we're working with it. Uh, better definition on ER locations, uh, as you mentioned, that'll come through uh, individual plan uh, proposals uh, to, to point out where ER is. Um, there's some, some broad strokes um, guidelines in both the Buffalo Lake IDP and the the South Shore Area Structure Plan that indicate where those should be and how to retain natural topography. Um, for example, we we don't plan on allowing developers to just roll in with a, a bobcat or something bigger than a bobcat, a bulldozer, and flatten uh, a whole quarter section. We expect them to follow the natural uh, landscape. Uh, phasing plan. So phasing plan less so is is development phasing plan and more so uh, the uh, future engineering designs for boat launches and infrastructure, including water, wastewater, and roads, so that we can peg values on developers. Absolutely, that's that's coming. And then the lots allocated for Paradise Shores right now, it's zero um, because their development permit has expired. Uh, and so before they do anything, they need to come back to the table. They need to meet our new higher standard. Um, and then we have to consider their proposal, work with them through it, work with them through public engagement, um, and that's that's when it'll be a decision on on what that looks like, and there will be, as I mentioned, public engagement throughout that process. Um, well, Sandra, can I add that? 
when this plan, if this plan goes forward and council decides to pass it, when we put forward the bylaw to um, withdraw from the Buffalo Lake IDP, we will also be getting rid of the area structure plan that exists right now for 1,000 lots for the old Paradise Shores development. That will be rescinded and no longer exists. So we're going to try and do that housekeeping all at once. And then this plan will then monitor what goes forward in the future. And we have no idea what's going to happen with that site. Someone might decide to buy it for acreages. Someone might decide to buy it for a campground. Uh, right now we have not, there is a stop worker on that property where things have to be um, finished on it for it to be lifted. And uh, all the development permits have expired. And I, I think that that's a very, poignant point that everybody that's listening right now, and I know there's a number of you that, that it's been the Paradise Shores has been a very contentious issue. Um, with the development of this and passing of this new plan, if it goes forward, the thousand lots that Paradise Shores was uh, allocated for back when, that's gone, it's done. They are at square one again. So um, I would dare say that we've learned some lessons through what we've went through. Uh, um, if you don't make any mistakes, you don't learn anything. And I will definitely say we made some mistakes and we're hoping to correct those and, and learn from them. So going forward, I think we've, we've tried very hard um, to learn from our mistakes going forward. So hopefully that will help people understand what we're doing that. Um, and I think that's a very good point. That thousand dollar or a thousand dollar units are off the table now. Um, and they're they're starting from square one. They have zero. So yeah, yeah. So quite a quite a detailed review of large developments is now required. A much better uh, review standard. Um, we've seen some great successful developments under the new regime already, such as G three. Um, very happy with it. We're working through Alberta Bio Boards, and they're following the same more regimented public engagement standard as well as the, the sort of plans they'll be required to follow. So. Um, Definitely our planning and development processes have changed uh, since 2018. Um, not in any small part because of, or not, uh, or it, it is not just in small part because of uh, Paradise Shores. I mean, we, we learned a lot from that as, as James said. And, um, that, and the big key is you're not starting till you have all your ducks in a row and that was maybe our big- It was the very first change was- We changed our land use by law to yeah. make sure that that happened. A lot of the changes people don't see because it's not hitting them in the right in the face, but we've made a lot of changes. So, and I think good quality changes. We have time for a couple more questions if uh, anyone has any, but uh, until I see a hand raised, I will just say thank you very much for joining us today and uh, having a really great discussion and conversation with us and providing your concerns for council to consider so that going forward they can look at this plan. Um, I see Councillor Neitz has her hand up so I'll be quiet. Go ahead, Cherie. Well, I just kind of wanted to do what Nikki said. I wanted to thank everyone for participating today. It's really important that everyone comes in here and uh, listens to the presentation and then um, we get to listen to your questions, to clarifications, so that when we make um, decisions in the future, we, we have all of your uh, questions in our mind. Thank you. I don't see any more hands up, but if you uh, do walk away today and have more questions, remember there's a session starting at 6 p.m. tonight that you're welcome to register and join. Uh, alternatively, you can email Jacinta, Kara, or Rich in our Planning and Development Department, department or you can call the County of Stetler. Uh, you have until May 17th to provide us with more feedback if you have more to give. Um, this session, as we mentioned earlier, has been recorded. It will be uploaded on the Stetler County YouTube channel as of May 1st and uh, available for everybody to view. And so pass it on if someone missed this meeting and wanted to know some answers to the questions that you asked today. Uh, thanks again, everyone, on behalf of all of us. And uh, I see Councillor Stolberg has one more word here. 
Yeah, I was going to remember that we have a, a new question come in. Yeah. Also, I have something to say after that. Thank you. Go ahead, Daryl. Hi, just a quick question. Uh, we've been talking about mostly about residential here. Um, definitely, if we're moving and marching towards a uh, residential development out here, like a, like a Chestermere or eventually like a Sylvan Lake, that's a recreational property, uh, a residential uh, community. Um, the provision for a commercial district is probably that needs to be planned early. Uh, it's just uh, something that's probably needed. Um, not, not so that, um, you know, the, whatever businesses locate here would be tourism related, recreation related. But I think uh, what I saw from the plan was that the, uh, the area allocated right now for the commercial is, is very tiny and it doesn't, it doesn't really incorporate uh, a thoughts for a bigger future development. I can quickly take that and I will actually have a point I forgot to mention at most of these sessions and we haven't yet is uh, on our YouTube page is a hour and a half long uh, presentation from Craig Till that does go into the details a bit more than or quite a bit more than his discussion did today uh, and included in that is uh, the, the points in our policies about um, that that commercial area is just an existing commercial area. Um, but future proposals can include commercial areas that are intended to benefit the um, the lake type community, so convenience stores, um, gas bars, things like that. Um, so that is, there aren't specific areas designated for it. And then just to speak to sort of the early lead up in your comment there, um, I don't think, and I'm not sure if it's ingrained in the Buffalo Lake IDP as much um, as I recall, but the uh, certainly, I don't think the direction of our council or, or largely our residents at this point has been that sort of high urbification of Buffalo Lake. I don't think we expect to see the uh, um, like the, the type of things that you would have uh, a whole town of uh, Sylvan Lake there eventually uh, between the, the Buffalo Lake IDP, our existing plans and our NDPs. They all sort of try to preserve the rural culture um, and additionally have particularly have uh, dwelling in it limits established at sort of more or less avoiding this, the, the Sylvan Lake gas style. So, I mean, I would welcome my council to comment if any of them have heard otherwise, but I, the, my understanding would be not to, not to go in the direction of urban. And I, and I think that's a, the Buffalo Lake um, IDP has, has made it fairly clear that the commercialization is not something that is wanted by all five municipalities. So on a go forward basis, um, this is a destination um, location and something that you would go to and then um, services would be found at uh, other locations around. So I don't think any of our partners have really commercialized any of their stuff. Um, and so I, I, I see small amounts of commercialization, but nothing to the extent of, uh, um, you know, mini malls or anything like that, uh, that I see going forward. So. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you there. And, uh, but, but uh, every community that is on a lake uh, does, does require some services, some commercial aspect, whether it's coffee shops, ice cream shops, uh, you know, beach wear, boat rentals, whatever. There's still, uh, still a need for that. And I think it, it needs to be identified as an area that needs to be set aside for the, the development. And you know, I, I agree with you. And I, I think some of that can be incorporated into more of a um, versus a commercial zone, but into more of a um, what I would consider a um, home based businesses, right? Uh, and if you, um, I, and I, I think of uh, the uh, national park like um, uh, Waterton National Park, um, the, the city's actual. <clears throat> area for commercial is very small in that footprint and very homey. Most people, most of the shop owners either live in their, their areas that they have there. So something like that is what I would see. I don't see, like I said, an all out. I don't see Walmart moving to the lake. Let's just say that. No, no, I agree. And, uh, but uh, is there a provision for uh, maybe some sort of a little bit of a light industrial too, uh, storage yards for you know, uh, people that are contractors, uh, um, 
landscapers, uh, plumbers, whatever, that might be in, in the community and need to store their, their uh, equipment and such? That's something that I've not never been on my radar and I don't think anybody's ever approached myself as a counselor that that's what they would want. And I don't think that anybody at the lake has said that that's what they want unless I'm, I'm open to let uh, somebody from the lake let me know differently, but not what I've been hearing anyways. No, certainly, but thank you. Kathy Hankins, this will be our last question today. Uh, more of a comment uh, um, than a question. Uh, if I refer to uh, page 21 of the draft, uh, projected population of the plan area and the last statement where it says the combined year round and seasonal part-time uh, resident population in the plan area may be between 7,600 and 9,000 persons. Uh, so uh, to me, that was quite, uh, uh, it was a bit disturbing. Uh, and I thought, well, that doesn't even seem like real, but you know, um, the lake has grown exponentially since I put my feet in it 74 and a half years ago. Uh, uh, um, just wondering, this is why um, uh, people are asking the question about, about uh, more uh, some commercial area and whatnot. Um, actually, when I did Roshan Sands Estates here, the very first lot on the east side of the road coming up, um, had been uh, changed to commercial and then the person thinking to build the store there decided to back out and we put it back into residential. But uh, yeah, um, I think uh, that's pretty overwhelming, 7,600 to 9,000 persons. Um, seems unrealistic to me. Just a comment. So Andrew, if I may. Um, Sorry, can you hear me okay? You betcha, go ahead. Okay, so the, yeah, the number is a projection at best, uh, Kathy, and uh, time will tell exactly how many we get there. And when you try to project permanent population where we have good data on the average household size, that's actually the easy part of the equation. The number of people coming up on a weekend, how many are in the party, uh, how many RVs are actually left there for that weekend and not used, that's the, the awkward part to figure out. Uh, so if we use just the solid data that we have, that average 2.6 persons per household, and every single development unit we're allowed to, to build was a household unit, not an RV site or not a, uh, uh, an RV campground site, we'd be up to that, that 7,000 population mark really quick. And that, that's a reason why ASPs are expected to at least look at the population level so that we get a sense of what kind of infrastructure may be needed or what kind of the land uses may be needed to support that like the two community parks that we've identified. Also, just on the point about the commercial, um, uh, some of that probably does have to be left for proposals to come. Otherwise, we can get into a game of picking locations that just don't work, either because the traffic generation there to make them survive isn't there yet, or the landowner just wasn't interested in that proposal. Uh, so there's probably some room to maybe add a more text policy as opposed to identifying a series of dots that are not likely to be built across the landscape. Uh, and the other part on the commercial, I think someone mentioned the light industrial and the storage compound. Those things may be better off accommodated outside of the growth node where you have a limited development capacity uh, and you're trying to create a certain character. So maybe that's more important just on the outskirts of Erskine or just beyond the plan boundary for those kind of uses. Uh, and Mickey, before I yield the mic one more, the Glynis Kent has a series of things building up in the, the chat. Yes. So I did, yeah, I did quickly respond to Glennis back in chat, um, just asking about how we changed the bylaws to prevent developer from doing the amount of below grade development that was done at Period Shores, um, as in the, the development that was done before they had a permit. Um, and my answer to that is yes, that was the section 16 you'll sometimes hear is referred to. Um, that allowed with our development team to prove and one of those provisions was uh, below grade development. Um, now we've really uh, tightened that language up to indicate that, you know, anything that's part of a larger project is not development deemed approved. Um, you need you need a development permit approval before you break ground. Um, and that's, uh, 
I think we'll go a long way in making sure that expectations are realistic across the board because you know, one of Paradise Shores problems where they were built by the time the appeal came in uh, and the decision on the appeal came in that vastly changed their, their business model. So uh, that's not good for anybody. So uh, we we definitely rectified that. Uh, Councillor Stolberg had a comment. Yes. I was just going to say to all the folks that joined in today for the public information session and the ones we've had prior and the ones that are still coming up, all the, the feedback that you've given us, the, your comments, concerns and things, it's, it's all being noted and, and it'll all be reviewed and discussed again and considered before this uh, area structure plan is approved. Okay, thank you, Les. And with that, we're going to wrap up. Oh, Council, sorry, CAO Cassidy has one more count comment. I'm sorry. I just think uh, it's important to, um, or I hope people realize, you know, how committed the county council is and administration is to it to Buffalo Lake and to keeping um, it, you know, the way it is. And I think the cap demonstrates that how many people can actually build and live there, and that you know. Um, it's something that if that ever changes, that's a huge amendment that has to go through five different municipalities. Um, and if it stays the way it is, especially the work that we did on the amendment with the Buffalo Lake IDP this last year to make sure that we were getting the right numbers and recognizing that cap. I just think that uh, goes a long way to, to, to keep the flavor of the lake. Um, and I just hope that people realize that, that we, do, we do hear them we're working very hard towards that and i think we are um we've demonstrated that in the work that we've done thanks event going once going twice uh councillor grover bye <laughs> okay uh so again thank you everyone um if you have more questions comments concerns please get a hold of our planning department and or attend tonight's session at 6 p.m have a great day everyone thanks <laughs>